<laughs> I went, why, why? I'm like, oh, that's right. I did sign up for that with her. Why did I <laughs> pick this? You could change any time. I could do it any time you want. No, it's totally fine. I'm just not okay. sure what I was thinking. I guess I was thinking um, it's the dawn, you know, in spring. Yes, happy Ostara. Yes. Am I even saying that right? I've never heard you know, it. I, I call the this the holidays by the scientific um, name at this point just because it's universal. Okay. It doesn't, you know, it because I'm like what it was a stara. I mean, it's German. I'm not even. I'm not German. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not. So there's lots of names for the holidays for ever, like pretty much every culture. So I just call it like the vernal equinox. It's my favorite thing to call it. Well, vernal, equinox. Equinox. Yeah, vernal equinox that's an actual scientific thing you know i i think it's important that we all see that because there's a lot of like misconception about religion being separate from nature which is like for me an impossibility like i cannot see that at all mm -hmm. <clears throat> like my religion is nature i love that you know mm -hmm. Yeah, because you asked me in the questions, like, what nature meant to me. So I thought about that. I think um, as far as maybe someone else could, it's very, that's difficult to put into words because that's a really big question. But I yeah. did think that maybe for someone else, like, how, well, how somebody feels about God, you know, that's to me how I feel about nature. And I had a feeling that that's <laughs> that the direction you would you were gonna go with it, and I just love that. And I just really wanted to like explore that a little bit. Yeah. Um, how you, yeah you see how you see beauty and how you see nature, and um, because mm. your aesthetic is so gorgeous, like I can mm. see in the room behind you, it's just everything is just so beautiful and so There's well some thought squirrels. out. Squirrels, some injured squirrels back there. From my, from my neighborhood that are recovering. <clears throat> One of them like got rat poisoned. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, you know, we have a rat problem in Eugene and people put out poisons and it affects absolutely everything in the ecosystem. It's so tragic. But vitamin K, I call myself vitamin K because I figured out how to use those drops, you know, to like counteract the rat, the anticoagulant pro properties of the rat poison. And I succeeded in saving a bunch of squirrels this winter. It was, it was crazy. I didn't think it was possible because of what was happening to them. Your devotion to nature is just so amazing. Like that's the whole point of my podcast is talking to passionate people about how they found their passion. Like, mm. how did you know that music was your path? How did you know that squirrels were your path? <laughs> yeah, I mean, squirrels are definitely, well, let's see, I'm going to turn it away. Sorry, I'm just, so my computer's brand new. I just got it for school. I think I might have just turned my sound off. Are you still there? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, yeah, this is not what I'm good at. This is what Emilio's good at, is mm. everything technological. So since we've been together so long, I'm... Um, I've sort of atrophied in that way because I just put it off all to him. <laughs> I had David set up my whole system and everything. So yeah, he got me all good to go. I'm the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. What was your question again? <laughs> uh, just, uh, just a small question. How'd you know music was your path? How'd you know wildlife or mm -hmm. you know, wildlife activism was your path? Mm. Well, um, I was raised in the Rocky Mountains by my dad, mostly, um, like in Idaho and way out in like the Sawtooth Mountains. Um, my dad was like a white water river guide and a mount, like a, just a total mountain man, you know. And we had like the first, the very first Jeep, you know, like once the Jeep was made for like offering, like we had the first one that ever came out. It came out the year I was born. Um, Jeep CJ7, you know, uh, and then it went on from there, like every year my dad would get another one. And so, I mean, our life was centered around just disappearing into the mountains whenever possible. And sometimes for like weeks at a time. <clears throat> and I didn't realize when I was little that it was because my parents had a really tumultuous relationship. Mm -hmm. My father would just take me away 
and they would they really sh sheltered me from what was going on so i didn't know until way later but um that's beside the point i uh ended up spending just a lot of time alone in nature as a child because my dad was um doing whatever mountain men do fishing <laughs> you know we were just always in the middle of nowhere it was common for me to see bears you know like all the time giant moose and um, I had a chipmunk that, you know, was my best friend at the time that was always, we would go to the same campsite year after year and I had this big rock and there was a hole under the rock and that's where this chipmunk lived. And, and I called him Chipper and um, he would just be there year after year and, and we would run off into the woods together. And I, I didn't have human friends, you know, I was really isolated and I had, animals as my friends you know and I didn't know and that it was that that was that anyone was doing it any differently really like I thought that everyone had chipmunks as friends you know I didn't know that it was unusual <laughs> um <clears throat> so when I got into like school and stuff you know later in life uh, I was sort of a, you know a loner I just I had always felt like you know kind of a weirdo <laughs> in school I was always like I had imaginary friends that were as vivid as anything. And if I got, you know, upset, you know, or if I got my feelings hurt, I'd just run off with my imaginary friends. And I was not realize that people couldn't see them around me because they were so vivid. So I would be like way out at school, like way out in a field, like making erratic movements. And the other kids are like playing volleyball or tetherball, four square. They're like, what's wrong with her? And I, in my mind, I am running with unicorns. And they're my friends. I mean, my imagination was so vivid that it was almost like debilitating in school. It made me like socially an outcast. Um, <clears throat> and so I would retreat further into it because of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, all of this. Yeah, my dad listened to really beautiful country music all the time. Uh, he loved Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton and just really pretty music. And he loved nature. And so <clears throat> those are the parts of my like upbringing that fed into my feeling like my family is nature, my belonging is nature, my friends are animals. Um, it got kind of extreme in my adolescent years. My mom left when I was 11. My dad kind of, uh, you know, had a, just kind of went into alcoholism. And I was alone, very alone from like age 11 until I left home. Um, and in that time it became, I mean, very extreme. I was home alone at a very tender age where I really needed support. And, and my father was gone until who knows, 2 a.m. in the morning, my mother was completely gone. And um, all I had was my animals. I mean, I would just like hold them, like they were my my everything. And even the trees in my yard became like my companions. And um, <clears throat> so sad to say, I hope it doesn't sound too sad, but weirdly, I feel like I just have always been embraced by nature. I mean, I feel like my devotion to nature comes from like that. That is who's always been there for me. Mm -hmm. The animals have always been there for me. The trees have always been there for me. So I will always be there for them. You know, like it's just the way it works. That's, That's how it beautiful. is. Yeah, it's just how it is. And I cannot turn my back on the animals that I that I rescue, which are these days becoming a lot. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to get get it under control, get my schooling, you know, my, my wildlife rehab or certification process is like, you know, it's intense. And um, I've written so many songs inspired by my relationship, the animals and nature. And, and actually it really just went fully there when the squirrels started coming into my, into my life. And I started exploring like, why, why is that, you know, because I was initiated into the oldest order of Gaelic Druids when I was 23 as a bard, you know, and the oak tree has always been like this symbol of everything to me, the acorn, the oak leaf, um, 
from a juridic perspective, from my Italian heritage, you know, Diana, all of it. Um, <clears throat> and then it's a very, you know, the oak is the doorway for the fairy realm as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it, the, the squirrels are the, are the children of the oaks. They're really one with the oak. And when they came into my life, the songs came with them. I mean, like the poetry, I just like never before. And I've been writing songs and poetry, you know, for a long time, but this was like, I was like, what is happening? Like this is, so then I started exploring what could possibly be happening. And then I found <clears throat> all kinds of references to um, the squirrels being the messengers of the, of the oak. Then, so for a bard or a poet to have a squirrel as a, or have squirrels around you, like the, the way that they connect the upper and lower worlds. It's just, it's like a function of nature and like you can tap into it. So then my songs took on this entire new, um, just, what would it, what did they take on? I don't know, it's vivid and it's very connected to nature. It's like beyond me, I guess I feel like I'm not even writing these songs anymore. They're, they're writing me and <laughs> it's like- just channeling through it. Yeah, and it really feels like uh, being absolutely intrinsically connected to the trees themselves and the animals. Like, I feel like I'm woven into their vitality streams sort of, and, like, I'm just sharing what I see in that with just the songs and the poetry and whatever I can manage to do creatively while I'm trying to get my, my rehab or certification, which is, <laughs> it's like a juggling act right now. My music is, I mean, like, the fact that my, the harp that I play the most has a broken string for a week now says so everything because I've never been able to leave a string broken for more than like five minutes. Like it would just really bother me, but it's been broken now for a week. So I'm like in my finals, I'm doing my <laughs> getting good grades. We've got a lot going on. Thank you for squeezing me in. I really appreciate that. Oh, yeah. No, it's a pleasure. I'm really glad because it's been a lot of the work I've been doing has also just been very like nose to the grindstone kind of mundane. Um, just a lot of cleaning and maintaining my rescue because I have a big sanctuary going here already. Um, and I can just, you know, that can it can bog you down a bit spiritually and it's it's the equinox and I'm glad that you, you kind of like pulled me into my favorite room in my house to talk about, you know, the things I love. It's perfect. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Um, I just really wanted to talk about how you see intention because I feel like that's something that you put so much into your music and as uh, one of my questions that I gave you was that like as an audience, we can feel your heart mm -hmm. coming out in the music. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to know like, uh, how much does that is pre arranged? Like how much is none, of it, none of it? None of it. It's, no, it's not. It's one, what it is, is a communion that I'm having the songs I'm writing are communications that I'm having with like the realm, say, okay? So that includes trees and animals, my ancestors, the wind, you know, the elementals. I'm really like communing with nature and that's what these little songs are. They're like little moments of that, that I'm sharing. Okay. They're really more like communications, I suppose. So intention is communication. I love yeah, that. Yeah, it's me communicating with with the, the world, my heart. That's how yeah. I communicate. It's how I talk to everything: the universe, animals, trees, fairies, my dead ancestors, mm. stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. It all comes very natural to me, and it's really nice to be asked about it. You know, because because I just like throw it out there and then I just go on with my life. You know, I don't really, I am terrible at self-promotion. <laughs> I think I'm working on something that's just really like my life's masterpiece right now. And, and I'm not gonna really do much until it's time to put it out there because I, I, I really want it to be heard. And I think that's, I see a lot of people in this climate and the internet and just the way that platforms have been extractive of creators. <clears throat> 
putting out so much beautiful work and just watching it get lost in chaos yeah. and dissipating. And it just doesn't, and not coming, and then they don't get reciprocated. They don't get paid. They don't get anything back for it. They may not even get the reflection they deserve because people didn't even see it because of algorithms or something. You know what I mean? It's just, it's right. a really, it's a disaster for creators right now, for musicians and artists, who especially in, independent. Um, so I'm just kind of retreating until I, I, I have a solid, um, safe path forward for my art because it's something that's I've been working on for decades really and I have a big vision for it and it also has a purpose in my mind that's beyond just me sharing my songs it's like I, I want to share these songs in the hopes that people will feel what I feel and want to help me help the forests recover help these my favorite animal in the world not go extinct you know Silver Squirrel. I'm working on a <clears throat> big conservation education outreach program for the endangered Western Gray Squirrel. And um, the songs are, you know, some of them are inspired directly by communications with these squirrels and their forests. Um, and so, yeah, this album is is not even it's not just an album. And I'm also I want it has to be on vinyl, but PVC vinyl is completely toxic. It's like the worst possible thing we could be pumping out onto the planet right now yeah it's made this huge comeback in music i didn't even know that right. it sucks yeah, it sucks. yeah. so okay. then and then yeah we just eliminated like <clears throat> cds from all technology so like for musicians who used to like produce cds well you, you, there, there's no cd drives in any like there's that's over yeah so then all what do we have like digital or vinyl, and vinyl is totally toxic. So another thing we're working on is um, the first ever uh, hemp vinyl record company. And my new album um, is gonna be one of the first hemp vinyl albums. So that's another thing that's keeping it all moving at the snail's pace, but it's, yeah. I really trust it because it's like following a creation spiral. And if you follow every step of it, when you don't take any shortcuts, it eventually becomes what it's, what is trying to come through. And in the case of the first Rosa Bundy album, it's been something that I've been following now for like a, almost two decades. <laughs> so, <I'm, laughs> so when I realized that like, there was no way I could put out this album, Guardian of the Grove and, and fundraise for, <clears throat> you know, restoration, Oak Woodland, you know, projects when, on PVC vinyl, it's just like poisoning the planet. Like I can't do that. So then it's like, now we got to create a hemp vinyl record company. You know? <laughs> and I mean, really that's what we're doing. It's like with fairy worlds, like Emilio and I, like we felt like, you know, we were kind of these weirdos, our music was weird. We sort of like built up a scene around ourselves where we fit in because we didn't really fit in anywhere, you know? So you created your own world. I love that <laughs> because I, I I always say that like my world was in black and white until we went to Fairy World for the first time, oh, and then I could see color all around me. I could oh see beauty gosh. all around me, yeah. and yeah, it was it was like that that opening for me. And I just really want to thank you for creating Fairy Worlds because oh, that's it, so it meant a lot. Yeah, well, that's a, I mean that's really what we hoped it, it would be. Mm -hmm. for people I mean I think what we were what we saw you know being out here on the far western shore like I like to call it is that we were so far from our ancestral homeland and we were in somebody else's indigenous world where our ancestors you know had done all of these crimes across the land and the culture is desolate. We're all uprooted. We don't know where we came from or where we're going, who we are, what we're doing. <laughs> we're all just like podcast out here. And when I started to find um, my my sort of uh, in white indigenous heritage, which was as a Celtic woman mostly, and also uh, Sicilian, Italian, and I start to look, look into those the wisdoms of my own people and where I came from and even the tragedies of how we left and got here um I found a lot of healing in that like bridging where I was out here to where I came from then I could start to see purpose 
why why did my ancestors make all their way all the way here and now i'm like this leaf on this family tree like what am i doing out here what for what is this and <clears throat> fairy worlds was kind of like an expression of bridging bridging those old worlds to this new world in the hopes of of sharing that healing that that i found i i I, that made me feel connected again to the, to the land, to everything, to realize, you know, realize that I <clears throat> came from this incredible family lineage of powerful people with their own culture and their own heritage and their own indigenous roots to the planet, even though I'm white, you know, because being a naturalist in, in America as a young woman, I had a lot of shame just that I, I was white, <laughs> even just being white. You know, I was looking to the Native Americans and looking to them and looking away from from my culture or lack of culture, you know, because I was like born in Los Angeles in the 70s. <laughs> you know? So I, I think um, I think fairy worlds was like, yeah, just trying to, to bridge the worlds and, and remember ourselves and remember our our connection to nature and to each other and our roots into the planet. And, and, um, and not that it was for white people at all, but, but that, that we needed that, like we were lost, you know, like out here out West, you know, the, the people who, who came into this country in the last few hundred years, you know, a lot of them were white and from Europe and, um, and and so the ones that were really conscious and 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 about nature and about healing you know I, it seemed like they were looking looking for their roots you know and i i kind of saw fairy worlds as a container for discovering that for people okay. and whatever and so then you could take it as deep as you want or 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 not you could just be a, a sparkly unicorn because that's the part of you that needs to come out you know and that was what was so fun about fairy worlds was there was just this deep magic going on at the center of it, but you could connect to it however you felt, you know, however you were comfortable. It mm -hmm. could just be all fantasy and fun, or it could be some really deep ancient like thing going down that's like prophesied for <laughs> like how there were many ways we could look at what we were doing. Um, but yeah, I think it was, it became increasingly difficult to do as travel became more difficult as mm -hmm. it became <clears throat> obvious that travel wasn't, you know, a green thing at all, even, you know, that bringing all these people from Europe was actually this massive toxic carbon footprint. And mm -hmm. like my original intentions with fairy worlds also <clears throat> were, were from like my naturalist background where like I hoped if people saw the spirit in nature that they would care more about it and feel like they had a sense of stewardship towards it. But it didn't really work out that way, you know. It kind of took on a life of its own and mm -hmm. I sort of retreated into my, my, I always was backstage in the final years, you know, with like a little bird or a little injured squirrel. Like I always had some little animal that kind of kept me from being able to really engage <clears throat> with the show very much anymore. And so now, yeah, I feel like it, it's just, uh, I feel like the spirit of it is still alive and moving and finding its new, new way in the world. You did amazing things during quarantine with Portal and with um, bringing virtual, like a virtual fairy world out into the world. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and we, you know, Portal is is just about to, um, it's just uh, just been finished and it's going to launch on Earth Day with this big um, international Earth Day celebration with all these activists and like I, I get to interview Paul Watson, you know, and uh, Ziggy Marley's play. And I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's uh a coming together of just some incredible artists and, and activists around the world to celebrate Earth Day and to kind of populate our new creator platform um, as we launch it out to the world. It's a, I can't wait for everyone to explore what Portal is. It's, it hasn't even, back then it was just, it having, it was just being used as a live streaming platform. Right. You know, that was, we were doing all kinds of things, but now it's, it's become, yeah, it's about to be, we'll see it on Earth Day. April 22nd, it's going to go live. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, Portal will help bring everybody back together. You'll see how it works. 
That's awesome. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, I would ask you what's next for you, but you told me so many great yeah, things. I talk a lot. To. I talk a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I so my goal now is to um finish my wildlife rehab or education and then I want to find land for um, a wildlife sanctuary and then I want to work um, in conservation for the silver squirrel and the decimated oak woodland habitats of the west that were sort of intentionally destroyed by logging companies that thought you know um, oaks were useless trees and <laughs> replaced them with timber stands and caused all kinds of havoc in our ecosystems out here and one of my you know, favorite animals in the world, the Western gray squirrel is um, on the endangered species list now in Washington. <clears throat> so um, I wanna move up there. I wanna get on a piece of land. I want to set up my sanctuary and I wanna work in conservation in schools and communities um, solving some of these problems collectively. Um, and I've created like an infusion program for schools for that called Project Silver Squirrel. And it culminates, it's a three year, a three-year proposal that I have, um, and it culminates each year in a big summer solstice celebration for the oak woodlands and the animals, and it's basically a rebirth of fairy worlds. If you look at what I wrote out, <laughs> I could even I could even send it to you. You can read it, um, but it's my new, yeah, it's it's my rebirth of it all. But it's just kind of bringing it back, the focus back to uh, conservation and taking care of the forests and taking care of wildlife and and <clears throat> being just really responsible stewards of this planet. Cause I think that's where humanity's really gone wrong. Um, we use everything as it's a resource for us, you know, mm -hmm. as if it doesn't have a, a, a right to exist on its own or we, you know, we just have lost respect for life. I think in a lot of ways, humanity, I want to spend the rest of my life doing what I can to, to repair some of the damage that has been done and, and if I just want to use all my creativity towards that end now, all my songs, all my festival throwing, all of it is just going to go in that direction now. But um, I have some just kind of work to do in the in the quiet of home, you know, to, mm -hmm. to get ready for the next the next adventure. But it's definitely coming. I can see it. That's it's, amazing. Yeah, I can see it being reborn. What advice do you have for somebody who's trying to find their path? Um, I think that paying attention to what really moves you, what because your purpose and, and what you're calling truly will call to you. It will call to your heart and you'll feel it, you know, something you'll will you'll and you may not it may not I didn't think I was going to go, you know, devote half my life to an endangered squirrel. <laughs> I had no idea. But then I had this experience and I went through, I felt something in my heart, like I've never felt, you know, and <clears throat> I said to Emilio, you know, like a couple of years, it was three years ago or so. I said, I think I'm experiencing a calling. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and I was grieving and going through so much pain and, and a sense of, being lost and not knowing where I was going or what I was supposed to do next. But all I knew was I felt this in my heart and it just kept growing and, and the <clears throat> animals kept coming to me and they kept needing me and I kept giving more and learning more. And all of a sudden I find myself completely absorbed in this work. You know, now I am like deep in conservation work and my wildlife rehab or certification and I'm on my way to buy land for my wildlife sanctuary and and it, my music is going to be a big part of how I share all this and, and get interest for it and support and <clears throat> and the way that I found my way was through my heart you know it just was it called I got called into it and you know, I think you just have to I think but I think it's very easy to be lost in this world because we're all looking, our eyes are designed to look outwards. Mm -hmm. We're all looking on our screens and we're looking into everyone's everything. And, um, and it's very, it's very easy to fall out of balance with seeing your inner world, you know, and being in touch with what's inside of you and the, the other direction, the inward place, you know, 
And so I think making time for that, because this world doesn't support that. This world is all overstimulation and distractions and making us feel insecure. So we buy products and, you know, it's like working against us intentionally on all levels. Um, it's like a mission to extract energy. We're like the podlings, you know, we're just, it's like so, <laughs> sucking the life out of us. And we have got to like shield ourselves from that and, and, and make time to, tune into your own heart and what your heart is saying. And it's hard to hear in the world that's so noisy and chaotic and everything's trying to get your attention all the time. It's very easy to lose, lose track of that voice, that inner voice, but the, it's always there and it always knows. I mean, that would be my advice and, and whatever, whatever makes you, whatever tools you have that help you to go inward, you know, use them. Have, have rituals in nature where you just sit and be and and listen in inwardly mm -hmm. that, you know because I think it's we ask each other a lot of questions we but how often do you sit down and ask yourself like hey are you okay what is that I feel what is wrong you know sometimes mm -hmm. I just have to ask myself I just feel this ache in my heart and I'm just trying to get on with my day I have to stop and go what is it, Kelly? As if I'm, as if I'm talking to a friend. What's wrong? <laughs> and give myself a chance to like listen to myself for once, because we're always listening. There's so much coming at us all the time. Mm -hmm. I love it's, that. Our true path is going to be revealed from within, you know. Okay. And, but we all thinking we're going to find it out there somewhere else, you know. But it will emerge from within. That's exactly my problem. I look outward and I don't pay enough attention to myself. Yeah. Absolutely. We're designed. It's like a design flaw. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> We're designed to see the outer world. But um, mm -hmm. only in blindness do you really see the inner world. Only in pitch blackness. Only in dark. And we're so afraid of darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone is the light, the light, love and light, you know, like as if the sheltering darkness isn't the most healing thing in the world. I like to go like deep in caves, you know, where it's just like no light. It's so black. You're like inside of the earth. It's one of my favorite things to do is be in caves. My name actually, Kelly, um, comes from the Irish, the Gaelic word keel, which means cave. Oh, wow. Yeah. You have shared so much with us. I'm so, so grateful that you agreed to do this and that you shared so much with us, with me. Yay, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for this. Yeah. And I can't wait for Earth Day. I can't wait for all the things you're brewing up. I need to get myself a hemp record. Like, <laughs> I can't yeah. wait. Yeah, it's all coming. It's all... It's these kinds of big things take time, you know, the big things take time and they sometimes have cycles and cycles and cycles of breaking down and building before something can even really be, be born. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we have to have patience and just trust that we're a part of something so much bigger than ourselves, you know, and just know what our values are and then we flow into into those areas of the world that are appropriate for us, you know. Good things come to those who wait. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So fun. where can people find you? If oh, you're I, not I know, I'm hiding right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, one, I have an Instagram uh, profile. I don't know if you want to share that one publicly or yeah, no, it's fine. Um, okay. I think that's under Rosamundi27. If you just look up my name on Instagram, it'll take you there. Uh, um, the show notes, yeah, yeah, um, the show notes, absolutely. And then the Woodland website as well. Woodland, yeah, the Woodland website just got put back up. It was down for a while. Um, and then <clears throat> Rosamundi will have a first um, single out. It should be by September. So at that time, I'll have my own website and everything. I'm just kind of waiting. And I'll probably pop back on Facebook for a second and just to say, here I am on Portal. Here's my website, da, da, da. And then I, I don't like to be on the uh, 
certain platforms that have been abusive. I don't like to support it. I don't even like to be a part of the energy. So I, I, I pretty much avoid Facebook. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, portals coming in, it answers a lot of the problems that, that happened in, in this like chaotic first stage of <laughs> global communication. <laughs> it needs some reform for sure. We've been working on that. <clears throat> well, I feel like you're single-handedly like changing the world and bringing all these, well, not single-handedly with a team, I'm sure, but yeah. Team. You're doing so much good work, and I applaud you so much. And oh, I'm so happy, so happy that you agreed to talk with me today. Oh, it's lovely talking with you. I love you. I love you too. Have a happy, happy equinox. Happy equinox to you too. Have a beautiful day.